the Dark Lord's malice, but... Jesus, now I see why Frodo didn't want to share the load. Lord of the Rings Conquest is one of the many difficult to acquire Middle Earth games. You can thankfully find a physical copy in a few used game shops, but digitally this game is lost to the void, taking all of its DLC and servers along with it. In addition to the 360 and now defunct PC release, it came out on the PS3, as well as the Nintendo DS. Its developers are Pandemic Studios, the same people who made the original Battlefront games. The idea was to recreate the Battlefront magic with the Lord of the Rings license. Given how different the two properties are, it makes sense that a lot had to be changed for this game to exist. Most notably, the armies of Star Wars, all six of them, I suppose, use guns, while Middle-Earth has more than just archers running around, so melee combat was practically necessary for this to work in any capacity. Whether the four replacement classes are interesting or balanced is something I'll get to, but it does feel like they tried to make them complement one another to encourage team-based gameplay. That's great! However, the servers shut down after a single year, so I doubt many people could tell you stories of how well that turned out. At least there's always instant action with the option for split-screen, a decently lengthy campaign mode which has its ups and downs, and the heroes were also thrown in, so even without the online multiplayer component, it's still possible to give this game a proper go, which is exactly what I did. No spoiler warning necessary here, let's just get started. Before we get into the interesting stuff, the non-gameplay aspects deserve their two minutes. The visuals are a bit muddy, specifically when it comes to the character design. I have no issues with it graphics-wise, but for clarity's sake, I should always be able to tell if a person far away is an enemy or not. The Gondor armies are easy to tell from the orcs and such since they have white garb, but some of the others blend in a little too much. Likewise, all of the maps feel very monochromatic, but I feel like this is just a problem with the Lord of the Rings license at this point. It's also incredibly annoying when Gandalf and Saruman are on the same battlefield since they look identical, and for some reason, Saruman has a blue magic shield instead of the red one the rest of the regular evil mages have. The sound design is nothing remarkable. Some effects sound like they were recorded in an echoey room, much like every voice actor in the game except Hugo Weaving. Hugo is the only actor from the trilogy to make an appearance, and thankfully they got as much mileage out of him as they could, as he's the announcer for all of the matches. I think it tonally fits right in that Elrond would be in the overseer position, watching and warning the player of victory or defeat. If the forces of evil gain but 50 more points, they shall be triumphant. The forces of evil have prevailed upon this day. That being said, when Elrond, the playable hero, is on screen, it feels a little weird to hear him talk about the game mode while also taking part in that game mode. The forces of good have seized the One Ring. The forces of good have claimed the One Ring. The music from the movies is in the background of the menus and in every match. This is something I didn't mention in my Battlefront 2015 video, but I actually got so annoyed by the constant Star Wars music during the matches that I had to turn it off completely. Maybe that's a slight against that game specifically, as in Lord of the Rings Conquest, the music only added to the experience and helped make the battles feel as grand as they should. The maps themselves are pretty hit or miss, all of them are locations from the films, or otherwise reimaginings of that area from a different perspective, however, not all of them are equally interesting. Pelennor Fields might be my favorite map in the game, simply because it has so many cool things to play around with, but there's no denying that it's just a random strip of yellow grass. I guess there's not much more they could have done, considering the source material. Pandemic seemed to want to make this feel like a larger battle, which is a good thought, however, the illusion can be shattered in a jarring fashion. Oh look, a big battalion of enemies, let me... Oh, yeah, right. An earlier mistake of mine could be viewed as even sillier, as I spend a large portion of my time with the catapult initially firing at this giant group of soldiers. Once I realized my kill count wasn't increasing, I also noticed, oh right, if these were genuine AI soldiers, there would be a haze of blue and red auras everywhere thanks to the mages. The catapults and turrets don't really do enough damage for my liking. I can kind of understand the turrets since they fire pretty quickly and are easy to aim with, but the catapults are tricky to use as the arrow used for aiming is tough to gauge and the travel time of the bomb is hard to account for. Not even being able to kill a mage in one shot is pretty lame. Even still, the catapult is a good time, but it's nothing compared to the mounts and the giants you can control. 
Trotting along on a horse or a warg is pathetically slow, and your attacks from either side are very finicky. However, once you smack that ass like you have 5 carrots in Ocarina of Time, you can mow down groups of enemies without even doing much. This seemed to have an impact on the game, as my AI team would win pretty easily when I deployed this tactic. This was a genuine surprise, since the AI in this game is so mind-numbingly terrible that even when you get half the required kills in a team deathmatch, you'll likely still lose because they suck so much. The trolls are my favorite thing in the game, however, I can't pretend that the way you select them makes much sense. I suppose they're the equivalent of a heavy vehicle, kind of. However, you can't dismount a troll or ent and keep on going as your class. Once your awakened giant dies, so do you. Swiping away enemies feels great, healing yourself feels pretty overpowered, but the best of all is the grab attack, which instantly kills the enemy and also allows you to play Spartan Gigante and beat a motherfucker with another motherfucker. While Pelennor Fields gets all of the goodies, the Shire has most of it as well, from mounts, giants, and turrets. Isengard and Minas Tirith both have turrets and giants, and Weathertop gets giants and catapults. As far as I can tell, that's mostly it when it comes to the Conquest game mode. The Mines of Moria do have cool narrow walkways to cross, however, it's hard to care about utilizing those as much since knocking enemies off the map doesn't increase your kill count for some reason, even though the load screen tells you to do it. There's also a random ass area nestled away in the mines, which seems like it would be a fun place to hold your ground in Conquest, however the command post is right above it, completely negating that area's use. This same underutilization of the terrain can be seen in the Black Gate, where at the very back of the map, behind the good team's command post, there's a stairway leading to a random stretch of high ground. This will only come in handy for players, as the AI never takes advantage of it, so more often it's devoid of any action unless in Team Deathmatch or Hero Deathmatch. Speaking of Team Deathmatch, the chosen game mode plays a role in if certain environmental weapons will be available or not. In Helm's Deep, there's nothing in Conquest, but in Team Deathmatch they added two turrets for some reason. Truly baffling stuff. Without the fun mounts, giants, turrets, or catapults, many of the maps are unfortunately pretty boring. This wouldn't be a problem if these levels picked up some of the slack in other ways, but they don't for the most part. For example, one of the first things I was hoping to see, since we're essentially coming from Battlefront 2, remember, were maps that had something similar to the Mustafar and Death Star bridges. A softball, or so I thought, would have been to take advantage of the ladders in Helm's Deep. Unfortunately, Helm's Deep was the most disappointing map in the game for me. The ladders are all propped up, but you can't kick them down, even though that's something you could do in the Two Towers and Return of the King. You can't even change direction when you begin climbing, it auto-moves you up the ladder. Really weird. The wall is already blown up, which isn't necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, however the action always seems to funnel to the innermost boring areas of the Stronghold, where none of the action took place in the movie. I really don't know why they didn't go with the idea of having one team try to keep the high ground while granting the lower team tools to take the wall. They even have the main entryway there and open, but in all of my matches I played locally, that was never something even contested, it was just an easy area to walk through. With this game supposedly encouraging team-based play, I don't understand why there wasn't more of a focus on small squads of soldiers palling around with each other to slowly advance and take over key areas. It seems like everyone just sprawls out or goes off on their own. Sometimes two mages will tag team for no reason. Sometimes you'll spot an archer all by their lonesome. Perhaps with other players and an online setting, team-based gameplay could have been more noticeable. As it is now, these bots don't coordinate very well. It feels like the devs made a conscious effort to make the classes complement one another more than they did in the Battlefront games, so there not being any way to round up some bots when you're on your own is kind of disappointing, as is their lone wolf style of play in the first place. Perhaps if they were able to fit more units into a battle at a time, this wouldn't have been as noticeable with just the AI. That being said, the game already gets so ridiculous with hits done when ganked by multiple enemies, adding in more units could have easily made it even worse. On the topic of hits done, that's essentially at the heart of what Conquest is. This is Stunlock the Game with the Lord of the Rings aesthetic. There are a few exceptions, but most often, an attack landing on an enemy will open them up for an entire combo or knock them down. You can still be attacked and take damage while on the ground, which is why it's vital to tap the jump button repeatedly to get up faster, or roll out of the way, which grants some invincibility frames. Because combos are so devastating and the stun lock so strong, in a way, Conquest becomes a traditional fighting game at times. Generally, once you've become familiar with a character in a fighting game, landing the first hit of a long combo chain can all but guarantee a large chunk of the opponent's health bar will be removed. 
At high levels, most players know which attacks to watch out for, so it becomes a tug of war early on, spacing, baiting, and getting the other player to lose focus or rush an attack. Well, in Conquest, none of that really matters. You just spam your longest combo and watch defenseless classes like the Mage and the Archer get destroyed. The Scout and Warrior both have a defensive stance, which is infinite for some reason. This likely was put in as a counter to the spam, but it feels pretty simplistic to just hold the guard button and avoid most melee damage. You can dodge out of the way as well, but with how clunky this game feels to play, you'll rarely be rolling at the perfect time like it's a Souls game or anything. There either seems to be a hefty amount of input lag when it comes to the guarding and dodging, or the other, more likely possibility, the defensive moves have a lower priority than everything else. It feels like even when holding down the trigger, your guard won't raise until all other animations are completed. This means both being attacked and dishing out attacks of your own will prohibit you from defending against something else. We could call this a high commitment style of action game, however I think that's being a little generous. Monster Hunter and the Souls games are also high commitment, but neither of the two feel as sluggish as Conquest does. Basically what all of this boils down to is you're very likely to die once you begin getting comboed, both as a tanky warrior and a wimpy archer. Again, I imagine with other human players on your team, a friendly archer or a mage could interrupt the spam, but with the current AI, unless you get lucky and the enemy whiffs an attack, getting comboed is game over. Before going any further, it's probably best to finally lay out the classes in the game. Warrior, Mage, Archer, and Scout. The Warrior is melee focused, has very good combo potential, has the most health, and his special attacks ignite his sword with flame, causing some powerful flourishes. To fill the bar up means dealing damage to the enemy and getting kills. He also has a throwing axe which is good at breaking an enemy's guard or closing distance on an archer. The archer is ranged focused, having five different types of shots. Fire arrows, which basically act as an explosive that knocks enemies down. A poison shot, which slowly trickles down the health of the target that was hit. A multi-shot, which shoots three arrows at once at multiple targets if there's more than one enemy nearby. The regular default shooting. And a zoomed in shot, which takes longer to fire consecutive arrows, but can deal considerably more damage, especially when aimed at an opponent's head. They have a kick in case anyone gets too close as well, which comes in handy when mages are nearby. The mage is the support class, as they can heal nearby allies, including themselves, and raise a spherical shield, which blocks incoming enemy arrows. They can also shoot a burst of lightning, do a few twirly attacks, a staff slam, and throw a fireball type thing out. Finally, there's the scout. The scout is the most overpowered unit in the game, and it's really not close. Their main gimmick is their camouflage capabilities, which allows them to turn invisible, thus opening up the opportunity to perform a backstab. The backstab, of course, being an instant kill. The stealth bar recharges at its own pace if the player isn't camouflaged, and if they deal damage to enemies, it comes back even faster. This is essentially the main problem with the scout. While the insta-kill backstab is already overpowered, they can easily fend for themselves given that they have basically as much combo potential as the warrior does, and of course they too can block melee attacks. They also have a throwable explosive, akin to the throwing axe from the warrior or the fireball thing from the mage. Whereas the previous three classes all seem to counter each other pretty well, the scout is in its own echelon all by their lonesome. The mage can protect their squad against archers, the warrior can get up close and wreck mages without much problem, the archer can fire at warriors from far away. Obviously all of them also have a countermeasure in place against their mismatch, like archers kicking mages, warriors throwing axes at archers, and mages shooting fireballs at warriors. The scout, however, doesn't give a fuck about any of that. When they turn invisible, they're near impossible to spot, especially in a hectic battle, and they can insta-kill any unit they like. I initially thought of the scouts as the counter to the warriors, since warriors have such a high health pool and backstabbing them takes them out of the fray pretty easily. Then I realized there really isn't a true counter to the scouts themselves. The closest I've seen are the archers, as their multi-shot can accurately hit camouflaged scouts if they're nearby, and their poison shot can reveal them as well. That is really cool, however you simply can't be spamming both of those shots all the time, so inevitably a scout will get behind enemy lines and wreak havoc. Against AI, they're essentially unstoppable. Conquest mode specifically becomes a broken mess if you just chill out in the furthermost enemy command post. Again, I'd assume with real players this wouldn't be quite as bad, since friendlies could call out to their team to warn them, and I would imagine most would gang up on a scout the moment they see one. I would also think human players would be able to tell that a control point is being taken over and begin attacking whatever is in the circle. 
However, I just play what I'm given, and all I'm given is single player, so that's that. AI heroes are able to detect regular scouts, but since the AI can't play as heroes in instant action, I can only test this in the campaign mode. This is another step down from Battlefront 2. I remember in my review of that game, I complained about heroes being locked to human players if there was a player on that team. This meant you couldn't have an AI hero running around helping you like in the first Battlefront, but you could at least fend off an AI hero if you were playing alone, since the opposing team didn't have a human player. They went one step further this time and shackled them to humans only, unless in campaign mode or hero deathmatch. Considering that heroes in Conquest aren't nearly as overpowered as they were in Battlefront 2, this makes even less sense. They basically function as slightly beefier versions of regular classes, so the fact that there isn't even an option in the menu to allow the AI to use them is a really dumb decision. Speaking of that menu, I couldn't believe I had my AI set to Legendary this whole time. Maybe this caused me to get ganked more often than if it were set lower, but even at the highest difficulty, archers still only hit one out of every four or five shots, even when you aren't even moving. It's embarrassing, honestly. The archers themselves are supposed to be an easy class to slide right into if you're used to playing a shooter, but the execution falls exceedingly short. It's pretty lame how enemies barely react to being shot half the time, and the hitboxes surrounding the enemy clearly don't match up. The sensitivity feels terrible, but I'm not sure if it's my controller or not doing that, so I won't hold that against the game, but it certainly feels jerky. I imagine the PC version holds up a little better. The most annoying aspect of being an archer is tied with the mage class. While it is nice that their shields are an obvious counter to the barrage of arrows, their not being a cooldown of some sort is pretty ridiculous. They're basically allowed to just hold up their staff and perpetually cast a shield over everyone. This is extra silly considering that both the scout and warrior have a bar that displays how long or how much of that power they can use. If the mage had something like that for their shields, it would feel a lot more fair for the archers, and in turn, perhaps the designers could have buffed the mage's lightning attack so they would be able to handle themselves a little bit better. Then, it would actually make sense for two mages to stick together, as they could protect the other one while their shield is recharging. I think if you made that change, decreased the warrior and scout's health pool a bit, and removed the scout's ability to perform stunlock combos, the game would feel significantly better. In instant action, there are four game modes to pick from. Conquest, Team Deathmatch, Hero Team Deathmatch, and Capture the Ring. Conquest is the game type that you'd think would receive the most attention. The game is literally named after it, so it sure as hell better be good. Unfortunately, it's not. The Middle Earth setting demanding melee combat seriously affected the fluidity of the tried and true Battlefront gameplay. With how slow everyone moves in this game, closing the distance on an enemy takes some time, and even then, it takes so much longer to kill someone than in the Battlefront games. In Battlefront, you take a few shots, and if you hit enough of them, there you go. Now, even when you have the advantage and are currently comboing to your heart's content, taking down a single enemy can take a surprisingly long time. This is why I don't think simply adding in more units for each side would improve anything, since it would take even longer to cut through enemies on your way to a command post. It sucks, absolutely sucks to see gigantic areas of the map devoid of all life, especially considering this is supposed to be an epic battle between two armies, not some random skirmish, but I don't think this game could function if even more mages and warriors populated these levels. Star Wars can easily get away with this, since it isn't strictly the battles from the movies, these factions fight all the time all over the galaxy. Helm's Deep is one battle, and that battle specifically had a story to go along with it. The elves and men were holding off the endless amounts of enemy forces, utilizing their advantageous elevated position as best they could, and doing everything in their power to thwart the many ways in which the Urukai tried to get through the seemingly impenetrable fortress. Now it's just a random skirmish, without even enough units in total to fill the screen at one time. Something that I forgot to mention in my script, and is why I sound different because I'm recording it after the fact, Hoth. Hoth is a perfect comparison to show how underwhelming Helm's Deep is. It is a huge battle in the film, but guess what? Even in conquest mode, everything that happened in Hoth, you can still do. You can ride the snow speeders, you can take down the AT-ATs, you can be in the AT-ATs. It has a story in the conquest mode from the movie. Yet, for some reason, in Helm's Deep, they didn't even try to do anything like the movie. They just have the map there and say, here you go, you can fuck off. Like, it's definitely within their wheelhouse, they just fucking didn't do it for some reason. Okay, uh, let's go back to the scripted stuff.
The conquest game mode in Battlefront felt like you were working hard to take areas of the map one by one and eventually get control of the entire thing or reduce the enemy reinforcements to zero. In this version of it, it feels like you're just standing in some rings arbitrarily trying to get a high score. Instead of taking down enemy reinforcements, you have to achieve a certain amount of points, the default being 300. As far as I'm concerned, this is a much worse way to go about it, especially considering the moment you hold more command posts than the enemy, their score essentially stagnates while yours climbs absurdly quickly. Even though the ring around the control point does offer a clear visual of if you're in position to capture it, and the ring itself being the elvish lettering from the one ring is a great detail, it's a little too gamey for my tastes. Watching the flag autonomously change to your side evokes a similar feeling. It also takes way too long for a command post to move from the enemy's control to yours. This goes hand in hand with the point system, as if you're already on the losing end, the enemy's score skyrockets. At one point, I even set the victory score to 600, yet 75 points wasn't enough of a window for me to capture a control point. 300 is the default victory score, which means it must take around 100 points worth when you're on the losing end to capture a single command post to have a chance at staying in the game. A third of the victory condition for one person to capture a command post. In Battlefront, if you were the last one alive, you had a chance to become the one-man army and pull off the upset. In this variation, that's not possible. Even ignoring all of that, I'm sure most people would agree with me that it feels so much more satisfying to get a shutout and watch the countdown commence or exterminate literally all of the enemy forces. It's really a shame how garbage Conquest mode turned out, and the fact that they used it as the name of the game is even more... Ironic. Team Deathmatch is exactly what you'd expect, however, like I said before, the maps modify depending on the game type. In Deathmatch, the level will sometimes be a much smaller contained version, like in Helm's Deep for example, the walls are completely closed off and jumping down there will kill you. Great. The enemies falling to their death not counting as a kill impacts this mode as well, as of course it doesn't register as a point for your team. I have no idea why there's a load screen that tells you that you should be trying to do this in that case, because it just doesn't work. I don't understand it. Uh, anyway, this makes Isengard, Mines of Moria, and many others more tedious, as you don't even get to have fun with the death pits in them. It's kind of baffling how this was never taken into account, since it's very easy to fall off the map, and a few attacks, like the Warrior's Axe, seem to encourage such tactics. It's also kind of ridiculous how long Team Death matches can take to finish. The Conquest games go by relatively quickly, thanks to the sped up points nonsense, but considering how inflated everyone's health pool is, the default 50 kill victory condition can make death matches take upwards of 15 minutes. This is why I set them to 25 almost immediately. Hero deathmatch is pretty great, but I think that's mostly because the heroes themselves are, paradoxically, the best part of this game, but also completely underwhelming. As I said earlier, all of them are just a slightly beefier version of one of the default classes, and unfortunately, not all of them are as beefed up as others. The warrior archetypes, such as Aragorn, Isildur, Nazgul's, Witch King, Elrond, and Gimli all have their own movesets that, while are mostly the same from a button combination perspective, at least offer some variety with the visuals and enemy reactions. The Witch Kings were my personal favorite, and if the Nazgul's flippy attack didn't have the possibility to catapult you off the level, I may have picked them even more than I did already. Warrior types aside, Legolas and Lurtz are the only archers for their respective teams, and they have the exact same arrows as the regular archers do. This is really weird, since in hero deathmatches there will be plenty of copies of the same unit, so you'll see a handful of Lurtzes and Legolases all over the place. Even stranger is the fact that Faramir is in the game, but he's a warrior class. Why not let him be an archer? Surely it isn't to keep the same amount of each class on each side, as there's always only five to pick from, and they aren't always balanced. Gandalf is the only mage on the hero side, but both Saruman and the Mouth of Sauron are mages. This is ridiculous on a lot of fronts. First of all, the mage class already doesn't make much sense given the low magic world of Middle-earth, so seeing armies of them is kind of insane. That being the case, why, in Hero Deathmatch, couldn't we pretend for a bit that the mage class isn't so out of place? Gandalf and Saruman make sense, obviously, but the mouth of Sauron? Come on now. It's even sillier considering both mages on the evil side are available on the Black Gate level, and considering that the mages feel pretty underpowered compared to everything else, 
Having two of that class running about definitely isn't a balanced play experience. Even more, on this map, the good side has two scouts at their disposal, which, as you may have guessed, are the best hero classes in the game, even if some walkthroughs would lead you to believe differently. While it is hilarious to see Frodo kill every major enemy in the franchise, Wormtongue take out Gandalf like it's no problem, and Eowyn repeatedly kill the Witch King for shits and giggles, it just seems so out of place to have these dweebs running around one-shotting everyone. The main problem with the heroes as a whole in the regular game modes harkens back to the issue with enemies taking too long to die. It's almost like they saw how OP the Jedi and Sith were in Battlefront 2 and toned them down significantly because of it. Even if it is fucking ridiculous looking, the stunlock garbage I'm willing to accept because it's so ingrained in what the game already is. However, at the very least, they could have bumped up the damage numbers for the heroes. Maybe I'm just terrible at the game, but nothing ever came close to providing me the level of power fantasy that playing Darth Maul did in Battlefront 2. That's pretty absurd to think about considering that you can play as Gandalf, the Witch King, and Sauron himself. You can even play as Balrog, which is not something I expected going in at all. Unfortunately, he too has to conform to an archetype. He's a regular warrior class, and his swings can't even kill normal soldiers with one hit. Need I say more? Either they should have increased how powerful the heroes were, or they shouldn't have restricted them nearly as much as they did. I could easily see this game working if they just put the heroes in every game mode alongside the regular classes. As it is now, they don't get utilized in regular conquest or deathmatch until about halfway through, and only on the player side. In fact, if that prompt shows up and you're busy, it may go away and you'll lose your chance, even though nobody else on your team can select them. It's hilariously stupid how much of this game points to it being multiplayer focused, considering the servers shut down after a single year. Before moving on, there's something extremely weird I learned of right before finishing up work on this video. There are secret abilities for certain heroes. If you hold down the strong attack button for a few seconds, then press the weak attack button with Aragorn, he does a weird taunt animation, then gets an undead healing aura under his character. To be able to pull this off requires some immense spacing, as plenty often I was interrupted by Wormtongue, because of course I was. Legolas, if you hold down light attack and press jump, can ride a shield. This feels like it functions as if it's a mount at top speed, except he can fire arrows while doing so. Why on earth are these so obscure? The controls menu doesn't mention either of these two moves for Aragorn or Legolas, and neither do the hints you find on the loading screens. One of them does, however, mention a secret ability for Eowyn. If you attack, then jump immediately, you'll perform a front flip and be invincible while doing so. As far as I can tell, these are the only ones you can learn about online. I have seen lists that show what other hero powers could be, but whether that's them simply making a guess based on nothing is up for debate. For example, I thought, oh shit, I have seen the AI use Elrond's Water Sphere. I wonder how you... Oh wait, that's just one of his energy attacks that isn't hidden at all. The sources online also got Eowyn's front flip attack wrong, since you can press any attack button followed by a jump to make it happen, not just the weak attack. The 5 seconds number for Legolas and Aragorn also feels a bit dubious. I got the shield to work with much less time spent holding the button. They also point out that Frodo can attack while camouflaged, but it's an unknown move. It's pretty known, you just attack while cloaked and you won't become visible. I have tested the counterparts for Legolas, Frodo, and Eowyn, and those special moves don't work on them even though they're the same classes. All of that being the case, this hero special power thing is so confusing, I can't wrap my head around it. Truly, so wild to me. Moving on from the heroes, finally, the last game mode is Capture the Ring, which is just Capture the Flag. The ring bearer moves much slower than normal, and if you're a scout and turn invisible, you move even slower. I don't particularly know why that's the case, since you can still easily see the ring, so I don't think being camouflaged would be that much of an advantage. If anything, it would be more interesting if you had to be invisible with the ring, since, you know, it's the ring that makes people invisible, I guess? <laughs> you know what I'm saying. It is rather peculiar how well this game mode fits with this license when you stop and think about it. You have to hold on to and take the ring to a specific location, and that location just so happens to be in the enemy's base? Sound familiar? It's a shame you can't hop on a mount when carrying the ring though, I think that would be pretty funny. It's so easy to use an archer to plop someone off a mount anyway, so I don't think it would be that big of an advantage. 
I mean, fuck's sake, you can use a troll and waltz right in no problems, so a mount being off limits is strange. Well, you can kind of waltz in no problem with a regular unit as well, because AI archers are just so fucking awful at aiming. Anyway, that's all of the instant action game modes, unfortunately. I say unfortunately, as there was an interview with the director of the game, Eric Gewertz, with IGN after the game was unveiled, and he mentioned another game mode called Ring Bearer. In it, one player would be Frodo, and the others would be Ring Wraiths trying to find and kill him. The longer you survive as Frodo, the more points you get until a Ring Wraith finds and kills you, then I imagine the players would switch positions until the round is over. This sounds a lot like what Battlefront 2015 had with Hero Hunt mode, however, the idea of the scales being flipped in the group's favor, since they're the hunting Nazgul's, sounds a lot more interesting to me. The one isolated player wouldn't be a tank trying to slay a bunch of goobers, they'd have to rely on their wits and try to outsmart and stay alive as long as they can. I don't know, it sounds pretty fun, so it's a shame it never became a reality. Because this is an older title, you can still play split screen, thankfully. So no matter what, as long as you have a couch and some friends close by, this game will forever be on the menu. I think it's pretty entertaining how, if you know the map layout well enough, you can essentially nullify an opposing player's overpowered scout with the use of screen cheating. Good stuff. You can also play the campaign mode in two-player co-op, which is kind of neat. The campaign itself is... quite the experience. For anybody who follows me on Twitter, you may have come across this screenshot. These were my attempts at playing the game for a video, and as you can tell, they're months apart. This is my experience with the first half of campaign mode in a nutshell. The first few missions aren't too bad, and in fact, at the very least, Helm's Deep feels a bit more climactic in the campaign, starting with the wall intact, then blowing up later on. I mean, it is super weird that you're encouraged to hop down when defending it, and it's even stranger that after you protect it from the torchbearers, you jerk off on the main gate for a while, directly leading to the wall being blown up. Smart plan. Isengard, Mines of Moria, and Osgoliath are tedious in their own ways, and because the gameplay felt so disgustingly sluggish to me early on, it made me second-guess my decision on ever doing a review on the game. None of that compares to the Minas Tirith level, however. This mission, specifically, was the cause of two separate months-long hiatuses. My problems with Minas Tirith are the same that I have with the rest of the campaign mode, which relates to the failure states. Running out of lives and running out of time on specific objectives will cause a game over. Instead of the reinforcement count that was present in the Battlefront 2 campaign, instead you, the player, gets a certain amount of lives. Hearing the voice actors proclaim that there's only one reinforcement left is pretty stupid if I'm being totally blunt. Quickly! Only one reinforcement remains! I mean, yeah man, why not just outright say, Hey, the player playing the game only has one chance left! You get a few more lives every time a major objective is completed, but the heroes near the end of the level were so annoying to kill, and given that they're able to spot you even when camouflaged as a scout, you obviously couldn't cheese them as much as other enemies. Honestly, the lives mechanic just doesn't fit for this type of game. That, however, was not the reason I gave up on Conquest so many times. The time limit garbages, and the ones in the Minas Tirith level, were the worst in the game. It's extremely difficult to defend a control point from endless enemies for two minutes when your allies are bumbling idiots, and like I've said a few times now, it takes so much more time to properly kill enemies in this game. If this was Battlefront 2, put me in, coach. No problems there. Lord of the Rings Conquest? Absolutely not. Of course, anytime you fail, you restart the whole level, so this opening where you need to defend the starting control point being essentially a flip of the coin if you succeed or not is mandatory every time you fuck up later on. Of course, you may want to quit out early, even if you do manage to get past it if you lost too many lives. You may need them for later sections after all, so better keep restarting the level until you can clear it without dying. After this, you burn down the orc siege towers, which isn't awful as the archer's fire arrows do the trick, which is cool, but after this is the real meat grinder. Defend this control point for two minutes. Fuck me, man. This right here, hardest part of the game without question. I've seen some people do it online with the warrior, but I guess I'm just not good enough with the warrior, so after months and months of this devil mission being on my mind, I finally broke free late last month when I was making the Shrek video. Oh god, the relief. You have no fucking idea. Pairing slightly high difficulty with slightly punishing consequences generally isn't the end of the world. However, if the gameplay itself feels as clunky, awkward, and unsatisfying as Conquest does, 
the punishment of starting from the beginning and fighting through the ridiculously tedious mission all over again, oh man, it's fucking awful. The cherry on top of this shit sandwich was the menu screen after you get a game over. After you fail the level, you have to select either restart, options, or quit. Those are the only things you can choose, yet to rub salt in the wound, I guess, when you press restart, it asks you if you're sure you want to restart, as all progress will be lost. This feels like gaslighting. The rest of the good guy missions are fairly standard, but I'll give credit where it's due. Everything after the Minas Tirith level was considerably more fun. Taking down elephants is quick time event city, clearing the way for your battering ram in Minas Morgul was a surprisingly good time, and destroying crystals as Aragorn while avoiding Nazgul's was frantic and enjoyable. The Black Gate level is fun, if only for the fact that heroes are the only units available. Once you complete the War of the Ring campaign, you unlock the Rise of Sauron, which is ten times more interesting. This is a what-if scenario of if Frodo didn't accomplish his goal. In the first level, you get to play as the Nazgul's, and of course, there's an objective with a time limit. You need to slay 20 orcs who don't want the Nazgul's to kill Frodo, since they want the ring for themselves, I guess? The campaign mode is the only place where you can fight against grunt enemies, which don't have much in the way of offense and have far less health. I had to redo this one quite a few times, so after a while, I started hunting the grunts to get my 20 in the two minutes. In both campaigns, the cutscenes before and after missions consist solely of scenes from the movies spliced together. It is a bit underwhelming, but what can you do? It is kind of interesting how the evil campaign essentially goes in reverse from the end of the final movie. Mount Doom, then Osgoliath, then Minas Tirith, Mines of Moria, Weathertop, Rivendell, and the Shire. It isn't perfectly in backwards order, but it's pretty close. The final mission has you ransacking the Shire, burning down buildings, killing hobbits, and taking down Gandalf himself. Every level has a hero defending it, and they all mostly make sense. Mount Doom had Frodo, Osgoliath had Faramir, Mines of Moria has Gimli making his last stand, Weathertop is Aragorn, of course, Rivendell is both Elrond and Legolas, the Shire has Gandalf, and Minas Tirith has the special tree. It is kind of a shame that there isn't a hero to defeat in Minas Tirith, but I guess I'm not sure which one would work best here. Merry, Pippin, Sam, and Boromir aren't in the game, and... Wait. Actually, Boromir was added in a DLC, which... Oh, right, is inaccessible now. In this now defunct DLC, they added Arwen and Boromir as playable heroes, and Gothmog as a playable villain. Kind of odd in a way, since the good side heroes already had more variety as it was, but I suppose that would always be the case, as even with Arwen and Boromir, there's still a few characters they could add if they wanted to. The maps in the DLC were Amon Hen and the Battle of the Last Alliance, which is apparently set in the Second Age. Both would be welcome additions, and I'm pretty salty I never got a chance to try them out. While the Lord of the Rings Conquest fails at being a competent Battlefront clone with a Middle-Earth license, it's not terrible. The Middle-Earth lore is apparently incorrect, you can no longer access online or the DLC, the scouts are broken to all hell, the gameplay as a whole feels fairly janky, and the Conquest game mode and the heroes are both underwhelming. However, the evil campaign is pretty enjoyable, hero deathmatch is a good time, the maps with environmental weapons and mounts are great, and the split-screen functionality is a huge mark in the game's favor. At the end of the day, just like with Return of the King, this game isn't great, but it's still a Lord of the Rings game that you can play with friends, which I suppose is good enough. Thanks for watching everyone, and thanks to my Patreon supporters, some of which should be scrolling by right now. I've updated my Patreon goals recently, which is fun. Instead of the very high dollar amount, which didn't have a reward, it's based on the number of patrons. Once I get 25, I'll create a community discord, and once I get 100, the patrons can choose any game and I'll try my hardest to make a video on it. Fun stuff. Join the Patreon if that sounds interesting or exciting to you. Hope to see you in the next video. Have a good one.